I thought I'd start by actually taking a very big view of what's happening and then narrowing it right down to how that impacts on bucks. So you can see some of the factors that really I think are going to impact on local government um, over the years ahead, certainly in the next sort of five years. Uh, let's see if that works. So what I'm going to do is first of all start with a little bit of a big picture in terms of that was the year that was. Well, it has been a real year, and I think for me, four of the big items on that, which are really going to impact local government, although it may not seem like it, are first of all Brexit, then the Donald Trump, the Donald, <laughs> the Italian referendum, which actually got very little coverage here in terms of its impact. But I just want to dwell on that a little bit. In terms of Brexit, why is that relevant to local government, you think? That's like, you know, that's been done and dusted, hasn't it? That's an argument in the House of Commons and the House of Lords now. What's really interesting, we have one of our senior officer team, a guy called Neil Gibson, who many of you will know. Uh, he's now um, a key player with the local government association that's looking at the implications of Brexit for local government. And they are massive, because so much of what is going on in the UK is actually derived now from European directives and regulations. And that will all have to be repatriated to the UK. And the implications of that is it should not just come back to national government, but actually one of the key demands of the local government association is so much of that really ought to now be effectively, uh, in the principles of subsidiarity, passed down to local government. So a lot of the work, particularly on things like waste and environment regulation, really now is going to be brought back from Europe to the UK. And one of the key demands we have is how does that now come down to impact on all of us at local level? So any of us who are involved in things like housing and environment and so on, the things that impact on people's lives locally, a lot of that's going to be coming back from Europe, and we need to keep an eye on that. <coughs> so Neil Gibson is a leading player on that for us. Um, the Donald, again, across the waters, what on earth has that got to do with us here in Buckinghamshire? What's really interesting is when you look at what his economic policy is, he's proposing a 15 trillion reflationary package for the US. That is the most phenomenal amount of money. And what that's going to do, when you start to inflate, if you like, the fiscal side of your economy, that's going to cause inflation, and it's also going to drive up interest rates. So as interest rates in the States start to go up, that's going to ripple around the world because interest rates around the world will be impacted. That's going to impact on the interest rates that we are going to have to pay as local authorities here. So when we look at things like borrowing costs, they are almost certainly going to rise now in the next five years, and that's something we're going to have to start taking account of, as well as, if you like, the opportunities potentially uh, offered in terms of exporting opportunities for our business, and also potentially getting American companies into the UK. But borrowing costs will almost certainly rise in the next five years. The Italian referendum, again, so what? That's just an Italian thing, it's internal, isn't it? Well, no, it's not, because the big issue, although the referendum was on reforming their electoral system in terms of decision-making their governance, the implication for Italy is really profound. The Italian banks are the most indebted of any of the European banking system. It's worse than Greece. And the problem for Italy is, if, well actually for Europe as a whole is, if the Italian system topples, it's only being propped up at the moment by central bank underwriting to a lot of the Italian banks, that will actually ripple around again the whole of the European banking system. So there is so much bad debt held by the Italian banks. <coughs> If that happens, we're probably looking at a fairly major recession in Europe. That will have a far more dramatic effect than the Greek, Greece economy would have. So there are really big threats about what's happening in Italy. And the fact that reform, reform there has been held up by the result of that Italian referendum. So we could be looking in the next four or five years at a significant recession in Europe. And that, again, would have a big impact on the UK and on employment right the way through to areas like Buckinghamshire. And then Theresa. Um, Interesting one. Uh, it's hard to believe, it's always hard to remember now the David Cameron era, because if you're involved in, uh, in politics, as many of us are, uh, it's a, it has a completely different touch and feel to the government of David Cameron. I mean, she is a completely different person. There is a very different character at the helm of the government now, and her policies are really substantially different in many respects, and the way she runs her government is very different from the way that David Cameron ran. And when you talk to top civil servants, and I have to do that quite a lot in my LGA role, you know, they will tell you it's as if there's been an election and a different political party is coming because it has so many different characters, has so many, you know, such a different feel to it. Um, so I want to measure on that and then just ripple that Theresa May thought down again into Buckinghamshire.
been doing a lot of work with the local government association on some of the big picture issues as far as the new government is concerned. What's very clear is the top of the priority is housing, housing, and more housing. They are absolutely committed and passionate to building a million houses by the time of the next election. Now, put that in perspective, that means building something like a quarter of a million a year in the next four years, 250,000. The historic run rate in this country since about the 1970s is half that rate, half that rate. So they're talking about virtually doubling the current run rate of house building. The only way since the war we've achieved those sorts of numbers is when actually the public sector, councils, were building houses right the way through the 50s, the 60s, and into the 70s. And a lot of that was linked to things like the new towns building program at the time. So there's a massive gap there. And what we're expecting to see early in the new year is a housing white paper coming out from a guy called Gavin Barwell. And he's absolutely committed to making sure that in that are all the right sticks and carrots to drive up really significant large numbers of houses, houses being built. The problem and the opportunity of that is there's going to be very significant carrots in there in terms of the ability to charge more, I suspect, for things like planning fees. But I think there's going to be some really big sticks in there in terms of planning um, delivery of houses, effectively not just if you like giving planning permission, but actually getting them built on the ground. Um, and I think that could ripple through in terms of local communities in Buckinghamshire coming under a lot more pressure, a lot more pressure um, to, to take housing numbers. Uh, and you could be expecting housing numbers not just from Buckinghamshire, uh, but also from areas outside of Buckinghamshire, like London. And I was in a meeting on Friday with the Greater London Authority, and they are beginning to talk now about counties like Buckinghamshire and those around London having to take really significant numbers of houses, potentially, that they cannot meet the demand um, for in London itself. So lots of issues there, I think, are going to impact on us quite significantly uh, in the next few years on the housing front. Infrastructure spending, again, really significant. One of the things that you noticed in the autumn statement was a switch away from what was perceived to be potentially a giveaway budget. There's been, you know, historically, George Osborne used to play around a lot with things like allowances and personal allowances. Uh, Philip Hammond is absolutely focused on productivity, and one of the levers on productivity is infrastructure spending. I mean, he's going to be borrowing something like an extra £200 billion by 2020, 2021. So over and above what George Osborne planned. That's a phenomenal amount of money. It's just about the total that the market will bear in terms of additional capital infrastructure borrowing. And most of that is going into spending on things like roads. Um, it's going into uh, some of the investment in things like broadband. But there's a whole package of infrastructure spending that's wrapped up in that. Now, the problem for us is the third point on that. A lot of the focus post the referendum on the EU is now on the Midlands and the North. If you talk to government ministers, the South and the South East is almost being taken for granted. There's a big feeling that we're okay. What's our problem? We're very prosperous down here. People have good jobs. There's very low unemployment. Um, you know, most people have houses. What's their complaint about? What's not to like? Right? The Midlands and the North, you get this picture of smoky, grimy towns, people disillusioned, and voting to leave the EU. So a lot of the focus on this just about managing category that Theresa's talking about is focused on the Midlands and the North. That may or may not be accurate, but that's the mindset a lot of MPs and ministers are getting into. So our challenge <coughs> as a county, collectively, is how do we ensure that we get the infrastructure here that goes alongside the housing numbers that we're almost certainly going to be expected to take? Because one of the biggest complaints, and we all know this in this room, that when you talk to local residences, if we're expected to take these housing numbers, and we don't particularly want them, candidly, if we have to take them, where is the infrastructure that goes with it? Where are the doctor's surgeries? Where are the roads? Where are the roundabouts? You know, where are the parks? Where is everything else? You know, and that's the massive, massive challenge for us, because uh, the political focus is really moving elsewhere at the moment. NHS prices. Um, again, massive issue if you follow the news. I mean, you'll know that nationally, uh, there are these things called sustainability and transformation plans the government is working on. Uh, we have one here locally. It's being developed on what's called Bob. Now, Bob is not the individual who's running it. Bob is Berkshire, Oxfordshire, and Buckinghamshire. And it's a footprint, i.e. an area, that uh, the NHS is looking at their overall services on. Uh, they're liaising with local councils on this. Um, and they are looking at one aspect uh, particularly about social care and health integration. 
particularly in the way that we look after the elderly, but also how we look after things like vulnerable children and so on. The financial pressures there are enormous. If you're looking at the challenge in terms of the NHS nationally, you're talking about 30 billion pounds that's needed to go in, 30 billion pounds that's needed to go into the NHS. The way the government has agreed that with Simon Stevens is that 8 billion, between 8 and 9 billion will be extra money the government will put in. The rest of that has to be efficiency savings that the NHS generates internally and then reinvests. That's a massive challenge for the NHS because it's not used, candidly, to have to find efficiency savings. It's used to year on year on year real increases in its budget. And there are massive demographic pressures there as well. So one of the things we have to do collectively in Buckinghamshire is think about how we work much more closely with the NHS. They want to work with us. They really do, because they've seen the way that local government has become far more efficient in the last five years. They think they've got a lot to learn from us. But it's not just, if you like, in the back office. There's a lot we need to do in the way that we present to our residents out there a much more integrated package in terms of the way we work together. And I chair something called the Health and Wellbeing Board, which is actually trying to marshal both uh, the NHS, ourselves, and other public sector bodies involved in health together. That's going to be a really major agenda in the next few years. Deficit elimination, I said, kick down the road. Just to give you an idea on the, the scale of that, uh, George Osborne was talking about running a surplus by 20, 2021. Uh, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. In fact, by that time, the national debt would have risen from around £1.5 trillion pounds to just a tad under £2 trillion. Pounds. Now, that's a phenomenal amount of money. And remember, that's not free money. Every pound of that that's been borrowed has to be paid for. So you've got to pay interest on that. It's a bit like having a very large mortgage. So that's going to put more and more of a strain on the overall national budget. But what we've seen is effectively what we thought was potentially an end of austerity for local government around that 2020 21 period is now probably going to extend probably for about another three or four years beyond that. So we have to now start planning for the longer term in terms of savings. We can't just take for granted that by 2021 we'll be out the woods. As a county, we have not been ignorant of these trends. We have been working very hard over recent years to look at how we can become resilient to those pressures. One of the things we've done is we've saved well over 100 million in the last five years. That's a very substantial proportion of our total budget, a really, really big. We've had to take some really tough decisions to do that. We've got to save another 45 million over the next four years. That's actually better. If you actually went back a year, it was 53 million. It's now another 45 million in the next four years. That's still a tough target. It's going to be meaning things like local services that people value are going to start coming under real pressure. You know, and you're going to start getting the, the hit from that as well when residents complain to you about some of the decisions that districts and counties are going to have to be making. <coughs> We're going to have to increase the focus we've already got on innovation and income generation. We have an income generation of well over 8 million. I think it's probably significantly in excess of that. I think we're very poor, candidly, as a county at explaining how much income generation we do. It's a very large amount. If it wasn't that 8 million, we would be making much bigger, larger cuts in services elsewhere. But because of that 8 million, we can actually continue to invest in frontline services that otherwise just wouldn't be there. Cross-boundary working. One of the things that flows from a lot of those pressures I've talked about is the fact that we are not an island anymore. Although we're Buckinghamshire, and everybody here lives in Buckinghamshire, we've got to work closely with other areas around us. So on the NHS, we've got to work closely with Berkshire and Oxfordshire. On the infrastructure side, we're working very closely with Oxfordshire, North Hampshire, Milton Keynes, Cambridgeshire and Bedfordshire, on something we're calling the economic heart of England, looking at the whole way in which we link together Oxford and Cambridge in a big corridor of growth. We have innovation with Hertfordshire on broadband. We have a very successful trading standards organization with Surrey. Uh, and we have relationships right across county boundaries all over the place. And we're just going to have to carry on doing much more of that. And the strategic partnerships, I've touched on the economic heartland. I can talk more about that if you want to. But absolutely fundamental to the next five years is going to be the way in which we think big, we think strategically about how we deliver things and that's not just going to be academic to your, those of you in town and parish councils. Those things are going to make real differences to the way that your residents and our residents feel about services locally. In terms of co-working with you, 
And I know everybody complains about the roads. I, you know, I get it in spades every day, but trust me, compared with where we were five years ago, we have come an awful long way. People forget just how terrible they were five years ago. We spent 110 million pounds. <coughs> that's capital expenditure. That's not day-to-day pothole filling money. That's a different budget entirely. <coughs> But capital, we've spent 110 million pounds on our roads in the last 10 years. Roads are phenomenally expensive. And one of the things that you get from residents, and we, we obviously get from yourselves as town and parish councils, town and port that is, and we had budgeted to go down to 10 million next year. Cabinet this morning listened to that. We've now put that budget back up to 15 and a half million for next year, with an additional one and a half million proposed for pavements. <coughs> I would ideally like to spend probably 20 million a year at 20 million, you begin to get to a stage where if you spend more than that, you begin to clog up the roads. Uh, but that's probably the maximum we can manage. But that really does show how we're trying to respond to the sort of feedback you're giving us. Uh, we've obviously worked with a number of you, and I recognise a lot of the faces in this room on the HS2 mitigation packages. We opposed HS2 for a very long period of time. We tried to persuade government that it's the wrong strategy. I still believe that completely. But given where government has got to, uh, what's essential now is we get the very best deal for the residents of Buckinghamshire, who are going to go through hell, hell for seven years while this is constructed. You know, and it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be pleasant, but we have to try and get the very best deal we can. And then we need to work together to actually explain what we have got to residents and try and mitigate on a day-by-day -day basis all those problems that are going to arise when construction starts in earnest. We have 86 devolution agreements in place, uh, and just to set one myth to bed, which I gather came up earlier, no one, no one, no one, if we start to go anywhere down the route that we're proposing in terms of changes to local government, is going to be forced to have a deal. <coughs> right? That is purely an option. If people want to come and want to take on more, now is the opportunity, but nobody's going to be forced to do anything they don't want to do. It's simply there for those who have the ambition or the desire to do that. We have opposed preset capping and we had a we had a meeting didn't we at a conference a couple of months ago and one of the things that was pointed out to me is you know there are some very ambitious councils out there who'd actually like to take on more services do more things generally but then actually would like some more money to actually add to those services to do a little bit more a little bit better and the government's proposing to cap that precept now i don't want to see any local council whether parish or town council get trapped into that sort of situation I mean, if it ever were to happen, you could always give those services back to us. Uh, but what we have done, and you know, I was asked to do it, I'm more than happy to, is we've come out very publicly against uh, precept capping for town and parish councils. Uh, and we've lent our voice to yours uh, in opposing that particular uh, proposal. Uh, we've obviously run, and we did it in consultation with what I still call Balk. Um, I can't pronounce him. Um, so uh, we've done that in consultation with Balk early on when we were originally thinking about what the changes in local government might look like. So you have been instrumental in helping shape those proposals up front. Um, and one of the things that we committed to do at that stage was then to come back out and explain to you, we've done it individually, council by council, parish by parish, uh, what that business case then looked like. And I won't go all through that again because you've heard it many times, but that was part of our pact with you our commitment to you and that's something we've done and obviously uh, we're now at the stage where we're completing that round of, of second autumnal consultation events uh, and this is another opportunity really to just pull those threads together so that's really what I wanted to say to you there is a big picture that I experience day by day in terms of what's going on that's going to impact on local government and I just wanted to try and share that with you to show some of the things that have been shaping my thinking on why we need to look at some quite dramatic changes in local government, because I fundamentally believe that the current model we have is just not sustainable going forward. Uh, and I guess the challenge for the Secretary of State will be to make a decision on whether he agrees with that, uh, and if so, you know, whether he wants to go with the business case we submitted. I understand other bodies are working up an alternative business case, I haven't seen that. I don't know any more details than have been in the press. I don't want to comment on that, but that will then be a decision for, for him. Um, and we welcome um, that debate taking place, so thank you very much.